This case is a tragic and complex tale involving suspicion, mystery, and a quest for truth. It all began with a well-being check requested by a concerned friend, which uncovered a series of alarming events and discrepancies. A man seemingly vanished without a trace, leaving behind his belongings, unanswered questions, and a family struggling to understand what happened. As investigators delved deeper, unsettling details emerged, pointing to a dark turn of events involving those closest to him. What unfolds is a chilling narrative that underscores the length some will go to in order to conceal the truth. On February 16, 2018, Scott Amatuccio called police and requested a well-being check for his friend Michael Shaver, since no one had seen him since November 15, 2015, more than two years earlier. Michael was a former commercial pilot who had been working as a mechanic, maintaining the monorail system at Disney World, and in November of 2015, had suddenly messaged his boss and quit his job. In the time that Michael had been missing, his wife, Lori Shaver, told family and friends that Michael had abandoned her and their children to start a new life with a new woman. Scott felt that the situation was very suspicious. Lori claimed that Michael left their house in a black SUV, but all of his belongings had been left behind in the home he owned with Lori. Scott also felt that Lori was using Michael's Facebook account, posing as Michael. He also let police know that right after Michael had gone missing, a concrete fire pit suddenly appeared on the home's property, and Lori also was quickly remarried. It was Scott's opinion as well as Michael's family that Michael would never have left his children to start a new family. Mike's older sister, Stacy Shaver, said, He is a wonderful, caring man who would give the shirt off his back to anyone who needed it. His two children were his absolute world. He loved his family, and we love him so very, very much. We miss him terribly. We are looking for answers. When police arrived to the Shaver home, situated on five acres at 9,850 Sandy Pines Road in Clermont, Florida, Lori told police that Michael had left them and gone to Georgia, and the last time he was at their house was when he picked up his belongings after his arrest for domestic violence in September 2014, and she hadn't seen him since a DCF custody trial in 2015. Lori was cooperative with police and allowed deputies to search the property until they began to focus on the concrete slab fire pit. When they asked if they could bring in a cadaver dog to sniff the slab, Lori told deputies to leave her property and come back with a warrant. Police then learned that Michael had no current cell phone and his Florida driver's license, U.S. passport and FAA pilot's medical certificate had all expired. He had no driver's license in any other state. His car had been repossessed in February 2016, and court paperwork for a civil lawsuit for non-payment of a credit card had gone unserved since he was unable to be located. Every friend or family member of Michael indicated that they had not seen him since the end of 2015. Michael was entered into the National Crime Information Center, and an official investigation for his disappearance began. During the investigation, Travis Filmer, who Lori began dating in approximately January-April 2016, told deputies that Lori had made the statement about Michael that it's not that he's missing, he's no longer walking this earth. She'd also said that something bad had happened to him, and there was a body on the property. November 7, 2015 was the last time Mike was seen in public with Lori and their two children by co-worker Frank Merritt when they were attending a tractor show. Frank noted that Michael and Lori hadn't seemed to be getting along that day and left the show early to go home. Frank texted Michael the next day and never received a response. The following day, November 9th, Michael responded and wrote that he was quitting work to save his marriage. Michael's next scheduled work shift was November 10th, and he never reported in or called and was never seen again. Michael's boss, John Borglum, indicated that Michael was a very reliable employee who never missed work without calling in. On November 11th, Lori sent a private message via a work server to her sister, telling her that 
Mike left yesterday, packed his stuff and went to the airport. On November 12th, John Borglum texted Michael and received a response. I'm having issues at home, in GA right now. Just fire me or I'll quit. I will not be returning any time soon. Co-worker Frank went to the Shaver home on November 13th to check on Michael and Lori told him that after they got into a fight about her finding another woman's number in his phone, Michael left and went to Georgia. Frank asked Lori how Michael went to Georgia since his car was at the house, and Lori claimed that a friend, Robert Mercado, picked him up and drove him there. When Robert Mercado was interviewed, he denied ever driving Michael to Georgia. Over the years, her story changed, telling some people that Michael had gone to New York and even California. She told the boyfriend's mother that Michael was a pilot who traveled a lot and told her work supervisor that Michael was in jail for not paying child support. On Monday, November 16th, Lori sent another message to her sister Alicia and told her that over the weekend, which would have been November 14th, 15, she did tons of yard work and cleaned up outside. Starting on November 9th, 2015, two days after Michael was last seen, friends and family of Michael began to receive Facebook messages from Michael that did not sound like him including the message to his boss that told him to go ahead and fire him, as well as telling his boss and Frank to keep his personal tools since he wouldn't be picking them up from work. He also told his friend Robert to leave me alone, don't bother me, when Robert planned to spend Thanksgiving at the Shaver home. In January 2016, Michael's sister Christine reached out to Michael via Facebook and received a reply that said, Everyone just needs to leave me alone, just like they did my entire life. In September 2016, ten months after he was last seen, Michael's niece Desiree also sent a Facebook message to Michael and received a reply. Who are you? I don't have family anymore. I have no clue who you are now. Stop messaging me. Michael's family pointed out that Lori wouldn't have recognized Desiree's maiden name, but obviously had it been Michael reading her message, he would have. As late as January 2nd, 2018, Michael's Facebook page continued to be updated. After November 9th, 2015, Michael's debit card was never used again for any in-store purchases, but on November 19th and November 23rd, 2015, two separate online purchases were made at Wish.com using his debit card. These purchases included female lingerie and clothing items that were shipped to Lori at her home. On November 30, 2015, a check for $2,539 was mailed from Mariner Finance in Leesburg, Florida, to Michael, to his home address. On December 11, 2015, the back of the check was endorsed, but the signature wasn't legible but included Michael's social security number and cell phone number, and three days later, the money was deposited into Michael's Chase account via an ATM in Claremont. Between December 14th, 30, multiple ATM withdrawals and purchases were made with the shipping address labeled to Lori. The person making the withdrawals and deposits would need to have the ability to intercept Michael's mail from his secure community mailbox, have access to his social security number, his ATM card for two weeks, his PIN number, and the knowledge that Michael wouldn't be around to notice the fraudulent deposit and multiple withdrawals and packages being shipped to his home. The account was eventually overdrawn and never used again. No purchases were ever sent to Georgia where Lori claimed Michael had gone. Over the course of three years, Mariner Finance tried to contact Michael to collect on the loan with no success. By the beginning of December 2015, Lori began attempting to sell Michael's guns, tools, and car. When one man, a potential buyer, came to the Shaver home on December 6th or 7th, Lori was home alone and told the man that the items belonged to her husband who had left, and since she didn't know where he was, she now considered them hers. While he was there to purchase the guns, Lori offered to sell him Michael's car without the title, as well as his tractor and the house and property, for $150,000. The man found it odd that Michael would have left without any of his belongings. 
A friend of the family asked to borrow one of Michael's tools, and as Lori led him to the shed where they were kept, the man asked if Michael would mind, and Lori replied, Oh no, he's not going to care again. He's never going to be back. Another friend of the family was at the shaver house after Michael disappeared, and remembers seeing what she believed was Michael's cell phone. After November 3, 2015, Lori never tried to call his cell phone despite the fact that on a normal basis she would call him multiple times a week. In February of 2016, Lori allowed Michael's car to be repossessed. It's believed that the fire pit was constructed in March 2016 and the concrete slab was poured in September 2016 by Lori and her boyfriend Travis Fillmore and they marked their initials into the concrete. Travis later indicated that before the concrete was poured, the hole was only three, four, deep, but he found it odd that the dirt pile at the edge of the property that Lori said came from the hole was far too large for a hole that small. The fire pit was seen in the background in a photo Lori posted on Facebook on February 27, 2017, and was also seen on Google Earth in March 2017. During this time, Lori continued to claim that she was in contact with Michael. After Lori told family and friends that Michael had left, she would indicate that she had seen and spoken with him and that he was stalking her but never reported the allegations. Lori told Travis that she was divorced and the two married on December 31, 2016 in a backyard ceremony despite the fact that her marriage to Michael was still valid. When her sister-in-law asked, Lori told her that she and Michael had gone to the courthouse to finalize their divorce, but they were kept in separate rooms. On Lori and Travis's wedding night, Lori locked herself in her bedroom after getting upset and pulled out a gun until she was talked down by a family member. Records indicated that Lori never tried to collect child support payments from Michael for their two children, and she never reported him missing, and there are no records that either Michael or Lori filed for divorce. After November 7, 2015, no one had ever spoken with Michael, and there is no indication that he existed anywhere after this point. Michael and Lori, who were high school sweethearts, had a very tumultuous relationship. On September 4, 2014, Lori called police to their house after she and Michael got into a fight over a home repair project. When police arrived at the home, Michael was on the back porch and told police that their argument turned violent very quickly, and he wasn't sure who touched who first. When they spoke with Lori, she told police that Michael grabbed her and pushed her into a wall and then went to their bedroom to get his gun, which they struggled over. Michael was struck in the head by the gun during the struggle. Lori grabbed her car keys out of Michael's pocket and left the house with her two kids. Officers did note bruising to Lori's arms and back, and when police questioned Michael about this, he said that he probably grabbed Lori by the arms to calm her down. He said that during their argument, Lori threw a vase of flowers through the sliding glass door. A co-worker of Michael's, Michelle Rippey, said about Lori, She's an evil woman. She was always very jealous and she had attacked him more than once. Michael was arrested and charged with battery because it's believed he pulled out the weapon, though he and Lori's statements were conflicting. Afterwards, he agreed to a plea deal that allowed him to enter a 12-month pretrial intervention program that he completed in only six months. After this incident, Michael and Lori separated, and he began living in an airplane hangar at work. In November 2014, Michael began dating a co-worker named Kendall, while Lori also began dating someone else. Kendall indicated that according to Lori, she was allowed to date, but Michael was not, and during one conversation, Lori threatened that he would never see their kids again, and she would use them as a pawn to get what she wanted. During their brief relationship, Lori frequently harassed Kendall through Facebook Messenger and told her to leave Michael or she would expose her to her family as a homewrecker. Another time, Lori called Kendall's mom, who lived in another state at 3 a.m., asking for Kendall. In April 2015, Lori called Disney HR and filed a complaint on Kendall using photos from Facebook. Lori also created two Facebook pages and sent friend requests to her. When Michael stayed the night at Kendall's, he would stop at the hangar first, 
just to be sure that Lori wasn't following him, and another time, Michael called Kendall and told her to park in a different location at Disney since Lori was on her way, and she had a gun. In May 2015, Kendall ended her relationship with Michael because she was tired of the harassment. After the relationship ended, Michael returned home to live with Lori and their two children. A witness and friend of the Shavers, Mary Lunenberg said that she received a message from Michael in either 2014 or 2015 before he disappeared that indicated that Lori wanted his life insurance. Mary wrote back, She's got to kill you first. Michael wrote, She tried to yesterday, I'm sure. Michael also told her that Lori would take over his Facebook account and his cell phone and pretend to be him if anything did happen to him. Michael's co-worker indicated that three, four months before he went missing, he noticed several bruises on Mike's face, chest, and arms. When they talked about it, he explained that Lori had become irate about something and began to punch him with closed fists. He asked Michael why he hadn't fought back, and he told him that it wasn't worth it. Police spoke with a married man named Jeremy Townsend, who began dating Lori in September of 2015, two months before Michael disappeared. He told police that Lori told him that she had left her husband. The first time he came to the Shaver home was December of 2015, and noticed dark spots on Lori's jeans that he believed to be blood stains. When he asked her if it was blood, she changed and never wore those pants again, despite the fact that according to Jeremy, she would normally wear them three times a week. Starting in February of 2016, Jerem's wife Vanessa began receiving Facebook messages from Michael's account that she didn't read at that time, as well as text messages from someone claiming to be Michael. In April, she received a flower delivery at work with the message, Roses are red, violets are blue, my wife is a whore, your husband is too. Sorry about this. Check your Facebook messages, we need to talk. Mike Shaver. According to messages via Facebook Messenger and text messages, Mike told Vanessa that he had installed a spy app on Lori's phone that captured explicit messages and photos shared between Lori and Jeremy. The purpose of these messages were to notify Vanessa of the affair to encourage her to leave Jeremy. When Vanessa wrote back and spoke about staying with Jeremy, Mike insinuated that he believed that Lori was pregnant with Jerem's baby. Mike also shared the contact information of a good divorce attorney. Vanessa ended up confronting Jeremy about the affair which he admitted, and in April 2016, Jeremy broke off his relationship with Lori. Jeremy told police that Lori got a tattoo with his nickname Jay in a heart over her vagina, which made him think she was more serious about the relationship than he had been and admitted that he viewed it as purely sexual. Both Jerem and Vanessa shared their information with police that included over 600 pages of text messages, Facebook messages, and photos between Mike Shaver and Vanessa, which all began three months after Michael was last seen. In February of 2016, Lori texted Jeremy, demanding to know why he was wearing his wedding ring again. Police discovered that the text messages sent to Vanessa from Mike came from a number that had only been registered to Lori and hadn't been active during the time before Mike disappeared. The flower arrangement had been purchased on Lori's checking account. On March 9, 2018, deputies served a search warrant for a cadaver dog and ground-penetrating radar to the Shaver property. During the search, they found the skeletal remains of Michael Shaver three feet beneath the concrete slab fire pit only feet away from where Lori married Travis. Michael was wearing socks, shorts, and underwear, and had been wrapped in a tarp and a fitted sheet that had been secured with ratchet straps. The sheet was queen size and had been purchased at Kohl's, which was a store that Lori frequented as proven by her bank records. DNA analysis confirmed that the remains belonged to Michael and his cause of death was from a single gunshot wound to the back of the head. A .38 caliber bullet was recovered from Michael's skull and time of death was determined to be several months to several years prior to the discovery. Lori was known to keep a pink point .38 caliber gun on her nightstand table. It's believed that Mike was killed between November 7, 2015 and November 10, 2015. 
A second search warrant for the Shaver home utilized Blue Star, which allows for the detection of bloodstains that are invisible to the naked eye, and indicated a positive reaction to the track of the sliding door that leads from the dining room to the porch. It showed a drip-like pattern down the outside of the trailer between the house and the porch. This substance, as well as hairs, were found in this area, but failed to demonstrate a sufficient amount of DNA for STR, short tandem repeat DNA analysis. Swabs from the interior lower door track of the sliding door showed a mixture of DNA from Lori Shaver and two unrelated individuals, with at least one being male. Michael Shaver couldn't be either excluded or included as a contributor. In March 2020, Lori made a YouTube video seeking donations for her defense and claimed that she would never cause any harm to the father of her children. She said that people are trying to paint a certain picture of her, but she says that she is loving, caring, and has a servitude heart. She says that she doesn't judge people, accepts all, and tries to see the good in everybody. On September 17, 2020, Lori Shaver was arrested and charged with second-degree murder, domestic violence, and accessory after the fact. She entered a not-guilty plea and posted $50,000 bail in December 2020 and returned home to her two children to await trial. The case has experienced multiple delays, partially because of the pandemic. On May 8, 2023, Lori's lawyer informed the court of having testimony from a minor child that confessed to committing Mike's murder. At the time of Mike's disappearance, the child would have been seven years old and is now 15. A motion was filed by Lori's attorney that indicated that Lori and Mike's daughter got a hold of a gun and shot her father to protect her mother who was being abused by him. The child is now wanting to testify because she doesn't want to see her mom go to jail for a crime she didn't do. Lori is claiming that she did not kill Mike, but her child as well as her now ex-boyfriend shot at Mike. Reports indicate that the child acted out because of repeated violence within the home by Michael Shaver. The defense wants the child to undergo psychological or sociological evaluation to prepare for testimony. It's unclear what charges the child might face. In the U.S., there is no federally mandated minimum age of court jurisdiction, and many states, Florida included, do not have a minimum age of criminal culpability. Florida did pass a law prohibiting the arrest or criminal charging of children under age 7, except in cases of forcible felony, a category that includes murder and manslaughter. Lori is still awaiting trial. Reflecting on this case, I am struck by the profound tragedy and the unsettling sequence of events that unfolded. This story serves as a stark reminder of the depths of human deception and the complexities that can lurk behind closed doors. The disappearance and subsequent discovery of the remains not only shocked the community, but also highlighted the critical role that diligent friends and family play in seeking justice. As I delved into the details, I couldn't help but feel a mix of sorrow and frustration. Sorrow for a life cut short and a family left in turmoil, and frustration at the seeming ease with which critical clues were overlooked for so long. The narrative of conflicting accounts, hidden truths, and the eventual grim discovery beneath the concrete slab is both haunting and sobering. It reminds me of the importance of perseverance in the face of ambiguity and the relentless pursuit of truth, no matter how deeply it is buried. This case has left an indelible mark on me, emphasizing that justice, although sometimes delayed, must always be sought with unwavering determination.